Greetings. Shabbat Shalom. Those of you who live uh, in California, you have a climate similar to that of the land of Israel. That's why, why you're more spiritual than the rest of us. Well, that's questionable maybe, but the climate in Israel is such that as you come into this time of the year, as historically we read about disasters that came across, upon the people of ancient Israel and Judah, uh, this time of year is the hot, dry, fiery season over there in the land of Israel. And it pictures the coming intense period before the climax of human history, before the Day of Judgment, which is pictured by the Festival of Trumpets, which is the beginning of the liberation of humankind. So it pictures the Great Tribulation. And I'll have more to say about that as we go along into that period. Uh, we are now in the fourth month on the sacred calendar. In the book of Hebrews, uh, to break into a thought, in verse 25, See that you do not refuse him who speaks, for if they did not escape who refused him uh, who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven. Jesus Christ came to the earth to speak, but when the Israelites were gathered at Mount Sinai, there was speaking from heaven. Verse 26, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he has promised, saying, yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Wow, the climax of human history. Now this, yet once more, indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken, as the things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Our character is really all that's going to ultimately remain. As we go, those of us who are the first fruits from physical to spirit, and this earth will someday be completely renewed. There'll be a new heavens and new earth. Verse 28, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. So the author of Hebrews is warning us, as I said, this is a time of year when we consider that sin is self-destructive and that our, the, our, the ancient, our ancient ancestors, spiritually or physically, if you want to, how, depending on how we understand it, but we are the Church of God and the ancient Church of God were the people of Israel and Judah. Uh, they suffered for their sins. They will ultimately, of course, be re redeemed, renewed uh, through their relationship to God through Jesus Christ. But we do have to maintain the standards that we know we need to maintain. As the author here concludes this thought, for our God is a consuming fire. God is all-powerful. He's going to, in effect, burn up the earth and create new heavens and new earth. Now, if you think of the Holy Spirit as fire, remember that if you're lighting a fire, you want to have fuel to feed the fire. You want to have protection that the fire not be blown out. And so we have to nourish the Spirit of God in us so that it does not, in effect, you know, flicker out. It has to, in effect, rage within us, a powerful fire that rages within us, a fire of zeal for God's way of life. Today I want to talk about a prophet proclaims priority. A prophet proclaims priority, priorities. We have to have priorities when we make decisions. And our priorities, above all, should be spiritual ones when we make our decisions. Yes, we live in a physical world. We have to consider, obviously, physical things. But in that consideration, we need to keep in mind, most importantly, you know, our salvation and that of those for whom we are responsible. I want to go back to one of the small books of the prophets that they call minor prophets. I want to go back 
to the book of Haggai. Chag. A Chag is a festival. There are Hagim uh, that God has commanded us to observe. And perhaps on one of these Hagim, the prophet Haggai was born. So his name could be translated Festal, F-E-S-T-A-L, from related to the word Chag. Now a Chag is a, there are two factors in a Chag, if you want to consider the etymology of it. One is the concept of a pilgrimage, you get up and go someplace, you know, and the other is the concept of a chug, a circle. You interact with others. Uh, you also celebrate with others. Um, in a, is, for example, you know, folk dancing was a factor in ancient times of such celebrations. So in any case, we have Haggai, and you'll see that one of the talks he gives here was during a festival. Let's take a look at the background. If you go to Ezra, the fifth chapter, where I won't go today, you'll see that the Israelite, the Jews had had, had pressure, <coughs> excuse me, pressure extended on them, which kept them from rebuilding the temple. And after a while, they just got used to it. And they, and they had excuses for not, not, com finishing, not completing the building of the temple. Sacrifices were being offered. There was an altar, but there was no temple. There needed to be a central sanctuary. That was a way that God ultimately chose to organize his theocracy. David had made the decision. God honored it. Solomon had built a beautiful temple. Because of the sins of, the, uh, of Judah, the, the temple had been destroyed. Now they were back in the land, and they had not. And yes, there was pressure. There was pressure put on them. But now they would be able to do it. But uh, they were not doing it. In other words, their priorities were askew. They were concerned with their own physical well-being, but not with honoring God with, with his temple. And things were not going well for them either, and they needed to realize why. God was, in effect, trying to wake, uh, you know, in effect, waking them up by not blessing them as they wanted. So in the second year of King Darius, so we're under the Medo-Persian Empire, we're in, the, uh, we're in 520 uh, B.C., in the second year of Darius, in the sixth month, that's uh, the month Elul, or the, you know, around um, um, August or early September. <clears throat> On the first day of the month, the word of the the Eternal came by Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua the son of Jehoshadak, the high priest. Sometimes he's called Yeshua, sometimes Yehoshua. He's the high priest. And so we have the, the king, who was a descendant of David, although he was not a king. So let's call him the governor. He was evidently Davidic, but he was not, not a king, no. He was a governor. And uh, he had a local autonomy. He could enforce the old covenant there, but he had to pay tribute to the Medo-Persian Empire. And, of course, his foreign policy would have been directed by, the, by what was best for the Persian Empire. And then we have Joshua, the son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, saying, this is what uh, the message was, Thus speaks the Eternal of Hosts, saying, The people says, This people says, The time is not come, the time that the Eternal's house should be built. Then the word of the Eternal came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses and this temple to lie in ruins? You know, you're concerned with your own uh, well being and your own standard of living. What about the spiritual matters? Now, therefore, thus says the Eternal of Hosts, Consider your ways. That's something you. That's a repeated theme in this book. Here you see it for the first time. Consider your ways. You have sown much and bring in little. You eat but do not have enough. You drink but you are not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves but no one is warm. And he who earns wages earns wages to put into a bag with holes. It seems that what we want is not so readily available, so that prices are high. Well, what would happen in our modern economy is an inflation where you know, the prices are, are high, so we're not able to uh, afford uh, to live well. Thus says the Eternal of Hosts, consider your ways. Here we see it a second time. Go up to the mountains and bring wood and build the temple that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Eternal. You look for much, but indeed it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, says the Eternal of Hosts, because of my house that is in ruins, while well, every one of you runs to his own house. Therefore the heavens above you withhold the dew, and the earth withholds its fruit. 
Now he's speaking in the summer, which is the dry season, but it can be dewy, and that is critically important. The word tal in Hebrew, do. And uh, in the Jewish liturgy, when you come to the, uh, I believe it's the end of the Days of Unleavened Bread, you, they pray for dew. They pray for rain at, at the Feast of Tabernacles, looking forward to a rainy season for the, uh, and preparing the ground for, for uh, planting of crops. And then uh, in the spring of the year, they look forward to a summer of dew. But in this case, the dew uh, is uh, being withheld. The 11, for I, called, I, for I called for a drought on the land and the mountains, uh, on the grain and on the new wine and oil, on whatever the ground brings forth, on men and livestock, and on all the labor of your hands. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the words of Haggai, the prophet, as the Eternal their God had sent him, and the people feared the presence of the Eternal." So isn't this great? You know, here we have the sixth month, the month before the Holy Day season, and that's a time when traditionally uh, Jews are getting back on track, you know, repenting, preparing for the uh, time of judgment, the autumn festival season. And so we have that situation here. Then Haggai, the Eternal's messenger, spoke the Eternal's message to the people, saying, I am with you, says the Eternal. So now we have a second message given on that, uh, that time, at that time, at that season. So the Eternal stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, and the spirit of the, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> and the spirit of the remnants of the people, and they came and worked on the house of the Eternal, their God. On the twenty-fourth day of the sixth month, in the second year of King Darius. So now we see that after about three weeks, they got busy and began to do the work that was necessary. And in a sense, you know, the temple is a type of the church. So you could say that one of the problems that we have in God's church is that at times people ignore the church, ignore the community, and are too busy with their own <laughs> lives and not considering the community, the spiritual organism that is the church, the kingdom of God in embryo, as, we, uh, as I have been taught in my younger years. <clears throat> now we come to the seventh month, uh, the month of the Holy Day se uh, season, the whole month of, of four uh, annual Holy Days, the month of the uh, eight days that come together, you know, that Festival of Tabernacles season. In the seventh month, on the 21st of the month, the seventh day of the Festival of Tabernacles, the word of the Eternal came to Haggai the prophet, saying, The seventh day of the Festival of Tabernacles, uh, as I said, is a time when people are focusing on the need for rain, and they associate the rain, of course, with God's Spirit, you know, physical salvation and spiritual salvation. And in later days, uh, this day became the great day of the feast, the time of, the, of, of many hosannas, Hoshana, please save us, Psalm, 120, uh, Psalm 118, Ana Adonai Hoshiana, Ana Adonai Hatzlichana, O God, save us, O God, prosper us. So it became known as Hoshana Rabbah, the great Hosanna day. That was in later years. So here, anyway, Haggai, in this time, on the seventh day of the Festival of Tabernacles, when there is a focus in people's minds on the Spirit of God, as you read in John 7, around verse 37, what Jesus Christ had to say there, uh, comparing the rains to, to God's Spirit, which was a, a theme uh, that the Jews understood, uh, although they didn't really fully get what he was talking about. Maybe I should go back there just briefly, since I'm talking so much about it. Um, I'm going to go to John 7 because it mentions when he talks about living waters, you know, Mayim Chaim, they really didn't get it because they were thinking about the need for rain physically. It was that season of the year. But then it says verse, in verse 39, but this he spoke concerning the Spirit uh, whom those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. So he was speaking here of the church that would be established on Pentecost later on. Anyway, let's get back to uh, Haggai, the second chapter. Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, 
and to Joshua the son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people, saying, Who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory? And how do you see it now? In comparison with it, is this not in your eyes as nothing? You know, the temple that they were in, in the process of, of, of uh, building, it was not like that beautiful temple of Solomon's. It was rather modest in comparison. Uh, you remember when they completed it, if you go back to the book of Ezra, I believe it's there that you know some were, were, were uh, rejoicing and they were so happy and others were in tears. There were tears of joy, but also tears of mourning, remembering how great the old temple had been. You know, and it kind of blended together, the tears of joy and the tears of sorrow. Yet now be strong, Zerubbabel, says the Eternal, and be strong, Joshua, the son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, and be strong, all you people of the land, says the Eternal, and work, for I am with you, says the Eternal of hosts. We can, be, we can maybe be feeling that way now. Many of us were part at one time of a great work, which really had a, had a powerful impact. You know, it had its flaws, but it had its, its great accomplishments. And now, uh, what we would understand to be the work of God, perhaps the most important work of God, others are doing good work in many, many ways, but let's say the authentic preaching of the gospel uh, is not going out in the great power uh, and effectiveness that, that, that it was at one time uh, in, in certain respects. And so we can be in some, you know, we can be joyful at what, at what positive is happening and yet at the same time sorrowful about what, what uh, we, we would like to see happening. But we have to be strong and we have to look forward to the fact that God indeed is going to do a, yet a great work before uh, the second coming of Christ. And maybe that will be in our lifetimes, we'll see. So he says he's with us, he was with them and he's with us. Verse 5, according to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you. You do not fear. I, you know, I said, the seventh day of the festival of tabernacles is associated with the spirit of God. For thus says the eternal of hosts, once more, it is a little while, I will shake heaven and earth and the, the sea and dry land. Remember, I, I showed how Hebrews Took, takes this passage in a later one, puts them together, and makes a, a message there, building upon this message here. We're looking at the climax of human history. Now, if you think about it, around 2,500 years ago, there had already been about 3,500 years of human history. There had been about 3,500 years of human history. So a period of less than 200 years would not be very much time uh, in, in, in the, uh, considering the entire re uh, span of, of human history up to that point. And so uh, beginning about 190 years um, well, um, after this event, um, or after this preaching, we have the end of the Medo-Persian Empire and really pretty much the, the end of the Old Testament uh, material. Now it has to be organized, dealt with, uh, properly uh, preserved, put together and organized and edited and preserved. And, and then the next period of, rev of uh, divine uh, scriptures comes with the, with the ministry of John the Baptist. So we have roughly a four centuries uh, period there with, without new scriptures. And so that is coming. And of course, it's foreshadowing ultimately God's intervention in world affairs at uh, the climax of human history. But in a way, it begins with the uh, Alexander the Great. Anyway, verse 7, And I will shake all nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations. And I will fill this temple with glory, says the Eternal of hosts. And uh, there's a question about what this could be talking about, but here it's capitalized in my Bible, and so it seems to be a, a, indicating really the desire of all nations is for the blessed one, you know, the king of kings and lord of lords. They may not really understand it, but really they, what people want is what God is going to give them ultimately. And so in, a, in effect, you could say the coming Messiah, the coming Savior is the desire of all nations. And I will fill this temple with glory, says the Eternal of hosts. So this second temple that is not going to be as impressive as the first will ultimately be greater because 
we know that there was a first coming of Jesus Christ, and he entered that temple. So God, uh, in, in the body of in the present in the in the bo uh, physical body of jesus christ that is to say the person of christ who was you fully <laughs> divine fully fully human the logos had become flesh and so we have god entering the temple so <laughs> the temple is much far more glorious than that of solomon in that sense and there's even more to the account as we'll see in just a moment the silver is mine and the gold is mine says the eternal of hosts so God has all the wealth in the world, and ultimately he can give the work what it needs to succeed. And in verse 8 and 9 he says, The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Eternal of hosts, and in this place I will give peace, says the Eternal of hosts. The Prince of Peace entered this second temple, but when he entered it, it was superior to Solomon's. It was the temple of Herod the Great, the great builder who wanted a legacy of great structures left behind, edifices. And so uh, the second temple at the time of Jesus Christ was an architectural marvel. And uh, he uh, entered that temple. And so both physically and spiritually, this prophecy is fulfilled. It also is fulfilled ultimately in the church, which as we understand is the antitype of the temple. And the church is far more glorious than any physical building. Now we go to another uh, date. You know, we've had the uh, the message on the uh, on the beginning of the sixth month, and now we have a message. We had a message on the twenty first day of the seventh month. Now we have another date, the twenty fourth day of the ninth month. So we go from the we now go to the ninth month, and we're in the uh, late uh, fall, early winter. Uh, this is the month what we call Kislev on the sacred calendar. Now, the uh, Jews have preserved the months with their Babylonian names, the, the names of exile, because we remain in exile, even though half the Jews are back home, uh, even if they all were back home, you know, still the exile remains until the Messianic age. On the 24th day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Eternal came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Thus says the Eternal of hosts, Now ask the priest concerning the law, saying, If one carries holy meat in the fold of his garment, and with the edge he touches bread or stew, wine or oil or any food, will it become holy? Then the priest answered and said, No. So you may have something holy in your, in your, in your clothing, but if uh, that clothing touches something else, it doesn't make it holy. And uh, so, in effect, you could say uh, the land of Israel did have within it the sanctuary, but the fact that fact alone <laughs> did not spread holiness uh, beyond the sanctuary. And Haggai said, "If one is unclean because of a dead body, because a dead body touches any of these, will it be will it be unclean?" So the priest answered and said, "It'll be unclean." So. If you're unclean because of, uh, spiritually speaking, you know, it has to do with, with rip temple ritual. If you're unclean because you've come in contact with a corpse, you can make something else then unclean. So uncleanness can be spread, and that's in fact what was happening. So the problem was not with the temple and not with the land, but with the people in it. You know, God's people had fallen far short and had become unclean and were spreading uncleanness. They had to repent, they had to get back on track spiritually, and this was a way to do it, to focus their attention on the rebuilding of the temple. They needed to get their act together, and, and they did, and they were blessed as a result. You know, so we, this is a positive book in the sense that we see a positive response, and you can read about it also in Ezra, and you can read about that Passover season when the temple was built and, the, and they were offering the Passover sacrifice uh, for the first time, there had been 70 Passovers missed, and now we have the, uh, you know, things are back on, on track. I uh, believe in 516 B.C. With, with the offering of the Passover sacrifice in, in a rebuilt temple. Then Haggai answered and said, So is this people, and so is this nation before me, says the Eternal, and so is every work of their hands, and what they offer there is unclean. And now carefully consider, oh, once again, Consider, and a third time we see it. From this day forward, from before the stone was laid upon stone in the temple of the eternal. So evidently we're dealing now that the dedication, the consecration of the building actually, 
The formal consecration is evidently on this date, 24th day of the ninth month. Since those days when one came as a heap of tw uh, to a heap of 20 aphas, there were but 10. When one came to the wine vat to draw 50 baths from the press, there were but 20. Things were not going well for you, physically. I struck you with blight and mildew and hail and all the labors of your hands, and you did not turn to me, says the Eternal. It's sad. People don't get the point. So once again, the fourth time, consider, you know, this is, uh, four is, of course, uh, talking about the complete land of Israel. Uh, you know, the, the people had to come together as one people and consider their ways and, and uh, unite as a people uh, under God. Consider now from this day forward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, from the day that the foundation of the Eternal's temple was laid, consider it. Is the seed still in the barn, and yet the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, the olive tree have not yielded fruit? But from this day, I will bless you. So he's evidently talking about a time when we, we can go out and plant and have confidence that there'll be a, a wonderful harvest that next autumn. And well, that next summer, even beginning with the with the uh, harvest of the of the uh, vines, and then into the you know, of course, before that, you know, the uh, the um, grain harvest and so on. That that next year of uh, next agricultural year will go well. And he says, "But from this day, I will bless you." And that was a prophecy. I don't have time to go into it fully, but we understand the principle of number from Numbers 14:34 and Ezekiel 4:6 of a day for a year in prophecy. And if you are students of prophecy, you understand the principle of seven biblical times, seven times 367 years biblically, and uh, 2520, 2520 uh, days, or a day for a year, 2520 years, projecting way into the future. In, uh, in November, I believe it was, of 1917, we had the Balfour Declaration. The British Empire, so powerful at that time, um, told the Jewish, promised to the Jewish community as they were at war with the Ottoman Empire, the Turks. The Turks ruled over a region which was called Palestine. It was not a specific uh, district or country or state at that time. It was a region, you know, the region from the uh, Euphrates to the Mediterranean and from just below Syria and Lebanon, down into the Sinai area, that region of Palestine was under the control of the Turks. The British were about to take it from the Turks, and they promised the Jews a homeland in Palestine. And then the next month, the British, with a Jewish uh, army with them, uh, the British did, in fact, uh, take Palestine from the Turks. And uh, the Turks surrendered on December 9th, 1917, to General Allenby. And what do you know? It was seven times, 2,520 years, from the time in 604 B.C., when the king of Judah, the Davidic monarch, became a vassal of the Neo-Babylonian Empire. The Chaldeans came to dominate Judah in 604 B.C., 2,520 years later. In 1917, the British monarchy came to be in control of the land of Israel and had promised the, they would create a homeland for Judah there. In fact, the student of prophecy, uh, I'm trying to think if his first name was George, uh, but his last name was Alan, and he wrote a book called Judah's Scepter and Joseph's Birthright that some of you may own. One book that you may not own is one he wrote at the time of the Balfour Declaration called The National Rebirth of Judah. He saw God's hand in what was happening. So he wrote that book as well, which I studied back in the 1970s. I found it at UT, you know, hook em horns, at the uh, library at the University of Texas at Austin. And, uh, so anyway, we have now a fulfillment of prophecy in 1917, December 9th, the 24th day of the ninth month, the Ottomans surrendered to the Brits. And now we could have the, uh, uh, in effect, a prophecy sort of jump start uh, and uh, the beginning of uh, what becomes the state of Israel. There's a lot more to that too, 
uh, to that prophecy, but I won't, I won't go further with it uh, at this point. Um, but I want to say this much, that when Allenby entered the city, he did so in a very humble way. He decided not to enter on horseback, but you may remember General Allenby uh, entered on foot in a very humble way because of the importance of the city of Jerusalem. But he entered on the Jewish festival of Hanukkah, interestingly, Feast of Dedication, which you find mentioned in John 10, 22, and 23. Anyway, let's go on here. He says, from this day I will bless you. Uh, and then again, the word of the eternal came to Haggai on the 24th day of the month. So now we have, um, so we have this date, which we already mentioned. So it's another message, but now on the 24th day of the month. So he has spoken and now he speaks again. Speak to Zerubbabel. And now we come to the end time, which we've already prepared for with the earlier passage. Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I will, sh I will shake heaven and earth. You see uh, the uh, Hebrews put together the earlier passage with this one. I will shake heaven and earth, verse 22. I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I will destroy the strength of the Gentile kingdom. So he's looking far into the future now. Uh, yes, Alexander the Great did this in, in type to the Medo-Persian Empire, but after him came the Roman Empire, and there will be resurrections of it until finally Jesus Christ, the fifth monarchy, comes to rule the world. I will overthrow the throne of the kingdoms. I will destroy the strength of the Gentile kingdoms. I will overthrow the chariots and those who ride in them. The horses and their riders shall come down, everyone by the sword of his brother. And we know that in the end time, there will be battles among these various predatory nations. Uh, and of course, then Jesus Christ will come and subdue them all. And in verse 23, we look forward to the resurrection of the saints. In that day, says the eternal of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shaltiel, says the eternal, and will make you like a signet ring. You know, he was ruling as a descendant of David. He was a governor. Now he becomes a type of Christ. I, uh, and Joshua in his own way is as well. He has the same name as, as Jesus Christ, and he's the, high, he's the high priest. So the two of them together are both typical of Jesus Christ in his role of king, as king and priest. In that, in that day, says the eternal of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shaltiel, says the eternal, and I will make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you. In other words, the seal, you know, of authority, confirmation. I will make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, says the eternal of hosts. I will take this, just as he said to Daniel, uh, a promise of the resurrection of Zerubbabel. And certainly I would hope and pray, you know, that uh, we could be a part of that as well, part of that, that first resurrection. So you see, the book of Haggai is telling us, keep your eyes on the prize. You know, keep in mind the important priorities in your life. You know, we have to have spiritual priorities as the, the major ones. Not, obviously, we have to do all the rest. You know, we're physical and we have to survive and, and hopefully thrive physically. But yet, our focus should be spiritual. Now, the Jews are going to be reciting Psalm 27 beginning in the sixth month as they uh, gather together to repent of their sins before the fall festival season. I want to go to Psalm 27 and verse 4 and show you wh where David's priorities were. And he was a man after God's own heart, as we understand. Psalm 27 and verse 4, Achad sha'alti me'it Adonai ota avakesh shifti bevet Adonai I want to go to Psalm 27, verse 4. One thing I have desired of the Eternal, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Eternal all the days of my life. Oh, to behold the beauty of the Eternal and to inquire in His temple. Speaking, I believe, here of the physical temple, but also the spiritual temple, you know, having a relationship with God, you know, ultimately, which, you know, we are, we are part of the, of the heavenly uh, family. And I want to go now to Matthew, the sixth chapter, because this is really the ultimate message of Haggai. Uh, so let's go to Matthew, the sixth chapter. And uh, in verse 33, Matthew 6 and verse 33. And if you haven't memorized it, uh, make it a project this week to do it, to memorize this verse. Matthew 6, 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. So Haggai was a, when we see Haggai, we see a prophet proclaims priorities. And our priorities ultimately 
Focus on the kingdom of God. All the best to you and yours.